Hey booktube, it's Peg. I am back at the History Shelf. Uh, thank you for joining me. Um, it's been a while since my last book haul and I'm excited to bring you new arrivals. Seems like I used to do them at least twice a week. Um, oh, there's Boomer creeping in the background. Um, but I've uh, been busy just trying to stay on top of my reading, uh, my book reviews, and my writing, and of course, you know, my full-time job. <laughs> which is really my priority. Um, but this is a very fun pastime for me, and um, it's very much part of my life, so thank you for joining me on my channel. Thank you for all the new subscribers, and uh, I love bringing you guys new books, new things on the horizon, history-wise, uh, or otherwise nonfiction. And, of course, from time to time, you'll see me do fiction. My last book review was on two pieces of historical fiction, and... Um, on Sashiko and the Eighth Life, and both fantastic reads. So I'll continue to bring you um, historical fiction reviews, uh, my thoughts on just about anything I've read. And for fun, I read mysteries and thrillers. And I want to uh, divulge here a little secret to you guys right now. I am wanting to go on a western binge. I don't know what the deal is. Um, I grew up reading Louis L'Amour's, and I love. I do love westerns. I've just gotten away from fiction reading in general because, to me, history is so much more fascinating because, you know, things actually happened. Um, but, boy, do I love a really good western movie, and I love a good western novel. So, um, if anyone has some great recommendations, just know I've read every single Louis L'Amour book. And, in fact, I am going to go digging through my storage... <laughs> I need to find my box that has all of my old Louis L'Amour paperbacks. I am longing to just go down memory lane and, uh, you know, smell the old yellowed pages and just remember when I read them as a girl. I just, I love Louis L'Amour. So, and in fact, I might be purchasing a few more paperbacks that um, include bonus material. I, I've seen recently they have something called The Lost Treasures of Louis L'Amour that his son has been managing his estate and putting in extra alternate endings that might have been considered for some of the books, not all of them, but for some. And um, they're on the bargain book outlets like hamiltonbook.com. And so I think I, for like four bucks. So I might pick up a couple of those just to see what uh, alternate treatment some of my favorite Louis the Moore Westerns received. But hey, that's for another time. And I will show those books on camera once I find them. Uh, but anyway, here at the History Shelf, we talk history primarily. So, let's get to it. Um, for those of you who follow me on Instagram, you saw that I, I posted a picture of these two books that I received from Other Press. And I want to thank you, Other Press. I'm looking forward to reading. Um, we have first this book that you probably, if you guys follow Steve Donahue's channel, have seen already. But I also I re received The Order of the Day by Eric Villard, um, winner of the Prix Goncourt. Um, it is a story of the um, annexation of Austria. Uh, oh, and the discussion's going on. Guess what? I got to pause, but I'll come right back. Okay. Is there someone at the door? And I'm back. Um, sorry, that was uh, not a package being dropped off. That was my other half arriving. So the dogs are happy. They've been given treats. We're back. Okay. So the order of the day. Um, uh, I think, you know, if you've seen Steve Donahue's channel, he has talked about it. Um, it's a very small book, maybe 132 pages, with really wide margins and such like that. So I could read this in a day. But, um, sorry, is this, we're losing my focus on here. Um, so it was like February 20th, 1933. The titans of German industry gathered to lend their support to Adolf Hitler. This support makes it possible for the Nazis to assume power. So March 12th, 1938, five years later. The annexation of Austria is on the agenda. It is a grotesque day, one that will make history. Uh, the newsreels depict a motorized army on the move, a terrible, seemingly inexorable power. Nazi Germany has its legend. But what if behind its first exploits were merely backroom haggling and cheap, self-interested schemes? What if the glorious images of the Wehrmacht triumphantly entering Austria concealed a huge bottleneck of panzers, a simple breakdown? Eric Villard's pithy behind-the-scenes account of the Anschluss tells a little-known story of corporate greed, failed diplomacy, and short-sightedness. Um, and this won the 2017 Prix Goncourt. Uh, that's France's most prestigious literary prize. Um, 
I'm intrigued. I'm always up for a uh, World War II era uh, study of, um, this is a very, you know, very focused or, or as Steve would call it, a keyhole history. So I'm intrigued by that. Thank you, Other Press. This, this book is actually coming out on the 28th. So today is the, what, 22nd? So six more days, but I got a finished copy. Um, that shouldn't take me too long to read. I just got to finish some of the others that I'm doing right now. Uh, the other really fascinating and interesting book that they sent me is um, a new release. It came out yesterday, July 21st. Berlin, 1936. Uh, Fascism, Fear, and Triumph Set Against Hitler's Olympic Games by Oliver Helms. Uh, let me just read this to you really quick because uh, this looks really, really fascinating. There's a really diverse set of characters or people that they follow throughout this book. Um, let me see if I can read it from here so you can at least look at the cover while I'm reading it. Um, let's see here. Okay, let's do this. Um, so Berlin, 1936, traces the events of the 1936 Berlin Olympics, a sporting and entertainment event that marked a paradigm shift in modern European politics. And perhaps the greatest propaganda victory ever, Nazi Germany hosted the Olympics in a celebratory cloud of unity, diversity, and lavish parties, while simultaneously planning the next world war and helping start the Spanish Civil War. The, the deception worked as the games gave many people new hope that Hitler could be trusted to keep his promises of peace. Uh, the book is a fascinating and eerily similar narrative of a world on the brink of international disaster. Um, with delightful anecdotes and individual perspectives from Nazi leaders, locals, foreign diplomats, sportsmen, journalists, writers, socialites, nightclub owners, and jazz musicians, Berlin 1936 doesn't just share a political exploration of the Olympic Games, but instead crafts an intriguing look at the world and Berlin during those ominous summer, summer months. Um, with the Nazi agenda put on hold while uh, international visitors got a snapshot of uh, the Berlin they wanted to believe in, Helms offers a last glimpse of the vibrant and diverse life in the German capital during the 1920s and 30s that the Nazis wanted to destroy. Um, and then it kind of talks about some of the, like I said, the, some of the diverse people that the book uh, kind of follows and their experience or their story. Uh, there's uh, a Jewish German boy secretly rooting against the Nazis during the games, a transgender German woman terrified for her life. Um, and then uh, there's also like a, um, uh, a woman with a dark secret who steps in front of a train. So, um, so this looks really good. Um, I kind of browsed through the book a little bit beforehand, and uh, it kind of almost reads like a little bit like a novel, novel narrative. So, um, I'm looking forward to this. Thank you, Other Press. So, two two outstanding books uh, on the docket for World War II reading or pre pre breakout of World War II. Let me set these here. All right, so the next book, um, this is something I bought. I, I sign up uh, for like newsletter alerts from some of my favorite university presses for history titles, and one of them is Princeton. And uh, Princeton University Press uh, had a sale, like a summer sale, a few weeks ago, or maybe a month ago now, and um, had a coupon code for ordering online. And this is a book I could not seem to find anywhere at a reasonable price, a price that I'm able to pay right now. But I heard an, an, an author interview with this, with this gentleman over a year ago. So it's been out, I think it came out in 20, that was 2019, okay. Um, but uh, it's different, and just the interview itself sold me on it, no pun intended, because you're going to see... I picked up The Story of Silver, How the White Metal Shaped America and the Modern World by, get this, William L. Silber. Eh? You see that? Isn't that funny? Silber writing on silver. I'm sure he gets this joke all the time. Sorry, sir. Um, so Princeton University Press this is a beautiful hardcover. I used the coupon code. I got like 40% off. Um, let me just read a, a little bit of 
of this to you. I, again, I, if I could find that author interview, I would like to link it because it just it made this whole topic sound way more intriguing and uh, interesting than just the title itself would tell you. But um, this is the story of Silver's transformation from soft money during the 19th century to hard asset today and how manipulations of the white metal by American President Franklin D. Roosevelt during the 1930s and by the richest man in the world, Texas oil baron Nelson Bunker Hunt, I've never heard of him, uh, during the 1970s altered the course of American and world history. FDR pumped up the price of silver to help jumpstart the U.S. economy during the Great Depression, but this move weakened China, which was then on the silver standard and facilitated Japan's rise um, to power before World War II. I did not know that. Uh, Bunker Hunt went on, went on a silver buying spree during the 1970s to protect himself against inflation and triggered a financial crisis that left him bankrupt. Silver has been the preferred shelter against government defaults, political instability, and infl inflation for most people in the world because it is cheaper than gold. The white metal has been the place to hide when conve conventional investments sour, but it has also seduced and uh, seduced sophisticated investors throughout the ages like a siren. Uh, this book explains how powerful figures up to and including Warren Buffett have come under silver's thrall and how its history guides economic and political decisions in the 21st century. So, and there's our author, Mr. Silber himself. Ha! Sorry. I'm easily amused. Can you guys not tell by now? Um, uh, again, I just, it sounded very fascinating. It's got this sweet chart here in the front here, silver prices for 200 years. Um, and it touches on just, uh, you know, like pressure points in, uh, or trigger points in American history. I'm particularly intrigued by how this affected Japan, uh, it, their rise to power because it debilitated China, which was, you know, kind of the, um, um, the break as it were, diplomatically, you know, they were putting the brakes on China, uh, Japan's rise, but weakened them so that in turn Japan became strong. So I am very intrigued by all of these, um, these topics. And I think uh, David Murphy calling you out, I think you would probably enjoy this as a history. Um, let me know if you have it or if you're, if it sounds like something you're interested in. I just thought of you. But, um, yeah, Story of Silver. So I picked that up for about 15 bucks, I think, with my discount. So that's not too bad. That's not too bad. All right, moving on. Um, this Okay, so I'll, I'll go with a book that I, uh, I purchased used. I think I purchased it via either Amazon or... Anyway, I saw this book on Steve Donahue's channel, and I thought it would make a good companion piece to... A book I recently showed in one of my last book hauls uh, called One Long Night about the, the global history of concentration camps. Um, and then I saw Steve hold up this book and he was raving about the author. He said that basically everything he writes is great. So I was like, well, let me check this book out. So I found a really great uh, copy uh, for probably about 12 or 13 bucks. And this is Black Earth, The Holocaust is History and Warning. By Timothy Snyder. So thanks to Steve for that recommendation. This is put out by Tim Duggan Books. I really like my cover. I think Steve had a different cover, but it's, um, as you can see here, it's, yeah, it's kind of very suggestive. Looks like, like ash, you know. Um, I don't know when I'm going to get to this just because, um, <laughs> This is really just heavy, heavy and dark stuff. Um, it's important to know, and I, I do appreciate the fact that he, he phrases it as, as a warning, because we do need to be, um, we should never, well, never again, right? We can never forget these things. Um, but also, I need to take a break. <laughs> um, from some of this, the heavier stuff that I've been reading. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but you know, just the state of the world today, um, I think it, it can affect your mental state of mind. And, uh, and then just reading for, for pleasure, you know, if you're reading 
I ha I need to find a, some balance because you know like I'm just happening to read books that either people have recommended or I'm supposed to review or this and that and I'm finding that I'm just uh, in a uh, I'm having a surfeit if you will of bleak and um, bleak and despairing stuff. I was reading a memoir last night which um, I'll be doing a little review for for someone else and um, this woman's husband died of cancer and I you know I'm up in bed at like 11:30 at night and I'm like you know tears in my eyes and I woo Peg needs a break um, because it's affecting my mental health as well but all that's to say um, I know this will be a good history I just don't know when I'm ready to read this along with one long night because uh, I need to balance my mental health as I'm sure a lot of you do as well with some other reading um, and for me that means as well really getting back in, in, in hardcore studying my, 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 my Bible and my spiritual reading because I need that and I know it's um, taken a hit recently with a lot of the different things that I've been doing um, but um, you know I'll save that for another video because I've got some things that I've been doing online some courses I've been taking and that uh, Boy, just even just taking one little 30-minute uh, uh, course and just engaging with the text, it really just it kind of lifted my mind up out of um, some heaviness. But anyway, that was just a personal moment right there. I just wanted to share with you guys. Um, <laughs> I hope everyone's doing well out there um, and you're staying. You're finding ways to, to stay um, as upbeat and positive as possible in the current situation in the world. Um, I'm taking a step back to also take the time that I need to uh, rest, mentally rest, and um, and do that. So um, I suggest and encourage all of you to do that as well. Okay, so the next book was sent to me by a publisher, by the great people at Casemate Publishing, because I am a military history fan, as you all know by now, many of you. Um, and uh, I've also, I've, you know, the Mongol, Mongol history is a... Um, one that I am always drawn to over and over. Uh, I'll read about it, I might take a break, and then it could be a couple of years later, and I'm like, I want to study the Mongols again. Don't ask me why. Um, but this book is a very detailed military history of military operations. So uh, this is for really hardcore military fans, military history fans out there, and I uh, want to bring it to your attention. We've got, this is a brand new book, by the way, The Mongol Conquests. I've got some uh, glare going on here. The Mongol conquests. Let's get that right. The military operations of Genghis Khan and Suba Ete um, by Carl Frederick Spurdrup. I'll give you a quick rundown on this book. The Mongols created, uh, created the greatest landlocked empire known to history. It was an empire created and sustained by means of conquest. Initially an insignificant tribal leader, Genghis Khan gradually increased his power overcoming one rival after another. Um, after he had subjugated all tribes of Inner Asia, he struck southward into China and later attacked distant Khwarezm in the Near East. Suba Ete continued to make significant conquests after Genghis Khan died, conquering central China and leading a large force into, force into the heart of Europe. Between them, Genghis Khan and Suba Ete directed more than 40 campaigns fought more than 60 battles and conquered all lands from Korea in the east to Hungary and Poland in the west. This book offers a detailed narrative of the military operations of these two leaders based on early Mongolian, Chinese, Near Eastern, and European sources. And this is the part of the book that uh, when I read about it made me intrigued because um, they knew, used new sources that were, well I'll read it to you right now, <laughs> making um, Full use of Chinese sources not translated properly into any European language, the account offers details never before given in English works. That's key. Uh, detailed maps showing the operations support the text. Uh, many conventional wisdom views of the Mongols, such as their use of terror as a deliberate strategy or their excellence at siege warfare, are shown to be incorrect. That is a bold statement. I like an author that just comes out and says, I am rebutting um, received wisdom. And uh, that's a pretty bold statement right here. So this is a major contribution to our knowledge of the Mongols and their way of warfare. 
Um, this is actually put up by the imprint Helion, but Casemate as the distributor, I believe. So this is going to be quite the read, my friends. Very detailed maps. Um, and it's making a very strong case for why, um, although I don't understand, um, I'll be curious to see how he, re he refutes that they use terror as a deliberate strategy. I mean, come on, they were the Mongols, man. <laughs> they terrorized uh, half the face of the earth. Um, but anyway, I'm intrigued by that. Okay, two more books, guys, and then uh, this book haul will be finito. I will have a couple more videos I need to do because I have some more books to show you. But I'm going to group them under um, their Liberty Fund books. And I know I've got some Liberty Fund fans out there. And I indeed picked up about four new Liberty Fund books to add to my Liberty Fund shelf, which is right there. That right there's my Liberty Fund collection right so far. And oh, I have some others across the way. So it's growing. Um, the next book I had uh, requested... A long time ago from the folks at Savas Beatty. They are a wonderful little publisher and they put out a ton of Civil War history. Uh, and when I saw this was on their upcoming releases, I knew that I had to get this. Um, and I, I do want to uh, put this on the docket for this fall I, or in the next month or two because I want to review it for you guys here. Um, this is Seceding from Secession The Civil War Politics and the Creation of West Virginia. Uh, by Eric J. J. Wittenberg, Edmund A. Sargis Jr., and Penny L. Barrick. Um, nice little volume here. I've always been fascinated by West Virginia just because they were extremely bold in, um, obviously at the time they were Virginia, they were part of Virginia, um, and they, they had no truck with the eastern side of the state. They were like, we are not seceding. We do not want to leave the Union. Um, they were extremely loyal, and uh, they had a lot of Lincoln supporters there. So um, I've always just been a very, uh, I've always admired, you know, people might, and I hope people don't, you know, people want to make fun of West Virginia because it's rural or whatever, but um, they were an extremely loyal state, and good for them for making that move. They seceded from a seceding state, and they said, no, we're staying. We're staying with <laughs> the Union and creating our own state. So, you know, way to go. Way to, props to you, West Virginia. Um, so, very excited. This is a brand new release from Savvy Speedy, and uh, thank you, uh, you guys. You guys are great over there. I love the, the books you put out. I have quite a large library of Savvy Speedy books that have come out. Not only Civil War, but they've done military operations in the um, American Revolution. Um, I, I've, I've been buying their books for years now. I have quite a library of military history. Um, they're very detailed with maps. They also put out like tour tour guide books. I think I have some here I could show you that you could use like if you go to Gettysburg um, or any of the, the major Civil War battlefields. Um, they have like perfect companion books that you can take along um, to give you a fuller, a richer sense of what was happening in those places that you stop um, on the battlefield tours. So anyway, fabulous new release. I'm so excited to read this. Um, I'm going to try to chart this one out soon to, uh, to read for you guys, or not read for you guys, but um, to cover on the history, the history shelf. Let me go, let me know, let me know guys, if you're uh, really interested and hope to see that one soon and I will bump it up, bump it up to the top of the list. Um, Okay, final book. I purchased this because the price had dropped and it was on my list for a while. And I've felt other fellow booktubers have raved about this book. It's been out many years now. I think you all know it's probably considered a classic. Um, it's a book of, I guess, essays um, or a compilation of, um, I guess, snapshots of different people. But anyway, I'm trying to see where this came out. This is. By Clive James, and I think you already know where I'm going with this. Um, this is this came out in 2007. Cultural Amnesia: Necessary Memories from History and the Arts by Clive James. Um, I recently saw that Lukash at Totally Pretentious had finally finished reading this, and uh, I told him on Twitter, I was like, ah, 
I keep wanting to read this, and then uh, I think John David had also recommended it and uh, raved about it. Um, so the paperback, it, the, the, the price just dropped dramatically on Amazon. So I was like, okay, I guess now's the time. So now I have Cultural Amnesia, and it is a large, a large book, let's just say. Uh, but, you, you know, you've got, he covers... Um, different people. And I like, I like books like that, that, you know, you can just take it in bite-sized pieces. Um, let me just read this to you real quick. An encyclopedic A to Z masterpiece. Cultural amnesia is the perfect introduction to the very core of Western humanism. Clive James rescues or occasionally destroys the careers of many of the greatest thinkers, humanists, musicians, artists, and philosophers of the 20th century. Soaring to Montaigne-like heights, this is precisely the book to burnish these memories of a Western civilization that James fears is nearly lost. Wow, that sounds right up my my uh, ap apocalyptic alley, as it were. <laughs> uh, got some stuff on Flaubert, W.C. Fields, um, a lot of people I haven't heard of. Um, <laughs> Oh, look, and I know how to pronounce this name now. It's Walter Benjamin. Okay, I got that right. I got that right this time. Uh, Louis Armstrong. That's interesting. Alan Moorhead. Um, a lot of uh, interesting folks in here. Uh, Karl Kraus. Oh, Ernst Younger, who wrote Storm of Steel. That's, that'll be interesting. John Keats. Oh, Yes. And I have this, oh yeah, Lezak Kolakowski. I have his massive book, The Main, uh, what is it? The Main Tenets or The Main Currents of Marxism. I have that massive work upstairs. Good stuff. So, picked up Culture Amnesia, so I finally have it. But uh, yeah, guys, uh, I guess this would be the stack. Haven't done a stack in a while. We've got Silver, The Story of Silver. Um, by William Silber. <laughs> it just cracks me up each and every time. We have Black Earth, which I don't think I'm getting to right now because I've been reading way too many heavy things, but the Holocaust is history and warning, but that'll go as a good companion piece to the other book I recently picked up on it. Um, Seceding from Secession, the story of West Virginia, Civil War politics and the creation. Fabulous. I've got the Mongol conquests, the military operations of Genghis Khan and Suba Ete. Woohoo! Um, the Order of the Day. By Eric Bullard. Uh, Berlin, 1936. The uh, All about the Hitler's Olympic Games and an interesting cast of characters there. Both of these books are from other press. And finally, Calls for Amnesia. So, these are my uh, very recent... Oh, I'd say they've come in in the last few weeks. Uh, so that's my book haul, guys. Okay, I'm just under 30 minutes. Uh, sorry for the little pause earlier. Hope you don't mind. Um, again, I have more videos to come. I need to make a Liberty Fund book video. That'll be fairly brief because I only have four of those to show, but I thought I'd just separate those out from here so I don't have a really long video. Um, and then I'm going to catch you up on uh, my current reads, and I know I'm behind on tags. So all of you kind folks who have tagged me, um, I'm still working on that. Uh, I need to get better at staying on top of tags. But anyway, I hope you guys are having a fabulous middle of the week. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone, all new subscribers. And again, we'll keep the history coming. We'll keep the book reviews coming. Let me know uh, what you think about any of these books, if you have any input. Again, I love, I love engaging with you guys out there. So take care, stay healthy, and uh, mentally and physically. And we'll talk soon. Bye, BookTube.